College, Damn Disciples, the Permeability of the Boundary Between Insiders and Outsiders in Early Christianity. Thanks, Matt. <clears throat> the, uh, the colloquium started early for me in the, in the airport when I was plucked out of the crowd for an extra line of questioning. And, um, and the man took my passport and asked me why I was here, and then asked me what, what my paper was on. And I said, well, I'm going to talk about how some early Christians decided you know, how an insider could become an outsider. And um, he said, OK. <laughs> and he, and he, handed, he handed my passport back and said, in, in Judaism, that doesn't happen. <laughs> How did early Christians explain the difference between outsiders and insiders? Let's all go home. <laughs> There's nothing else to say. <laughs> no outsiders. I was I was tempted to say something about at least ancient Judaism, but I I was glad to have my passport back. You never check with these was the current visible assembly of the elect expected to be the same as the real one, as it is known to God and will be revealed in the judgment? And if not, that is, if the empirical church is not convertible with the real people of God, how was this potentially troubling fact understood? Were insiders to think of themselves as potential candidates for exclusion? Or were outsiders totally other, of different stock, such that movement in and out was not possible. All early Christians, as far as I can tell, recognized the fact of apostasy, but they offered widely divergent explanations of what this actually meant. Early Christian texts also evince uh, very different expectations about the permeability of boundaries. Uh, the ease with which insiders might slip away and outsiders might slip in. Today, I examine these issues by looking just at Matthew's Gospel and the letters of Paul, chosen both for their, their influence, um, their disagreements with each other, and also because I'm dissatisfied with the way that they're handled in the secondary literature. I'll begin in reverse chronological order, following Matt's example with Matthew. A major concern of Matthew's Gospel is to show that insiders will retain their position only if they do what God requires. The performance of just deeds is paramount. All other criteria for determining the difference between insiders and outsiders are relativized, if not totally erased. We see this first in John the Baptist's unfriendly reception of the Pharisees and Sadducees who come to him for baptism. As in the Lucan parallel, the Baptist warns that deeds, not ethnicity, will determine one's fate in the coming judgment. Similar warnings are hurled at the leaders of the people subsequently in the narrative, such as the parable of the two sons, chapter 21, which suggests that the chief priests and elders claim to be obedient but are not, and the wicked tenants, also in chapter 21, which accuses the same opponents that they are about to be set aside because they fail to do God's will. That Matthew has harsh words for Jewish leaders and that this reflects the conflict of Matthew's own day is well known. More interesting for our purposes is Matthew's insistence that Jesus' followers who do not measure up will themselves be cast out. The status of those in Jesus' ecclesia, as he calls it in chapter 16, depends on their continued obedience to the commands of God, just as it had for the Pharisees and their ilk. Matthew's special interest in righteous deeds as the main criterion of inclusion can be seen in a number of uniquely Matthean passages and in his distinctive reworking of material shared across the synoptics. So you find this in Mark and Luke, but it's much stronger in Matthew. For instance, in Matthew 7, after describing the way to life as a narrow gate which excludes most people, and warning that trees that do not bear good fruit will be thrown into the fire, as John the Baptist had warned. Jesus says that in the judgment there will be many who will be cast out, despite having performed sundry miraculous deeds in Jesus' name. These apparent disciples will say to him, Lord, Lord, and cite their impressive accomplishments, 
but they will be revealed as impostors because they did not really do the will of God, which for Matthew would presumably mean Jesus' teaching and his interpretation of the law. Insiders are, therefore, in a sense, in no better position than the religious leaders against whom Matthew polemicizes. Both must obey and continue to obey to be in good standing. The parallel fates of Jewish leaders and the members of the church who do not measure up is vividly demonstrated in Matthew's parable of the wedding banquet, chapter 22. Those who are invited to the banquet ignore the invitation and murder the king's messengers. So the king's, you know, has a banquet. The king retaliates by burning their city. This is often seen as a, an allusion to the sacking of Jerusalem. Because those who were invited were not worthy, the king's servants then go through the streets and invite everyone else they can find, both evil and good. Um, this is often thought to echo Matthew's <coughs> earlier claim that many will come from east and west and eat with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob while sons of the kingdom are thrown out. But it's worth noting that the parable is directed at the chief priests and Pharisees and not the wider crowd. And that's, that's where the parable ends in Luke and Thomas. There's a bizarre conclusion, which doesn't have a parallel in the other versions, which ends with a warning to the new group, which was invited in after the original um, invited people re reject the invitation. And it goes something like this. Uh, the king comes in and sees the guests, you know, who've invited in from uh, highways and byways, it's Luke's phrase, and he notices a man who's not wearing a wedding garment. And he says to him, friend, how did you get in here without a wedding robe? And the man was speechless. Then the king said to the attendants, bind him hand and foot and throw him into the outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing teeth. This uniquely Mathean epilogue, heavy with redactional language, and almost certainly the evangelist's own creation, cries out to be read allegorically. Wedding garments were not required of guests, and in any case, even if they were, these guests were just pulled off the streets. Whatever the garment signifies, it doesn't really matter. Many would think of good deeds. The conclusion indicates that Jesus' new group of insiders can be cast out just as their predecessors had been. Matthew's church is, as Augustine put it, a corpus per mixtum, including both wolves in sheep's clothing and true disciples. Matthew alone among the Gospels sets out instructions for how to identify and expel unrepentant evildoers. He is particularly preoccupied, however, with the sifting that will occur when Jesus returns and, quote, repays to each according to his deeds, collecting debts and paying wages, an event vividly and climactically described in the conclusion of Matthew's final big block of teaching material in chapter 25. I'll consider just the final three passages briefly. In the first, Jesus' disciples are like ten bridesmaids watching for the coming bridegroom. Five bridesmaids remained vigilant and were able to go with the groom into the wedding banquet. The other five weren't quite ready and are locked outside. They cry, Lord, Lord, but are banished from his sight. In the second of these three passages, the parable of the talents, which is also in Luke, Disciples are warned to do good work while the master is away or be shut into the outer darkness. The third and final passage describes the day when all the nations will be gathered and separated into two groups, those who serve the Son of Man by helping the hungry, thirsty, lonely, naked, sick, and incarcerated, and those who didn't. The former group is welcomed into eternal life, the latter to eternal punishment. All other criteria are ignored in this final depiction of eschatological sifting, only those who helped the least of these brothers of mine avoid perdition. Even if there's rhetorical exaggeration here, there probably is, that is, even if Matthew thinks there's more that determines who is in and who is out than just who helped the needy, Matthew at least gives the impression that everything depends on acts of mercy and anyone can be excluded. This point is worth stressing because commentators have often recast Matthew's language of necessary deeds into vague language of affiliation. That is where Matthew insists that disciples must actually do the will of God, commentators have often attempted to make this positive outcome 
more or less the automatic result of association with Jesus. For instance, and this is representative of a broad stream of interpretation, Joel Green recently wrote that for Matthew, quote, those who align themselves with the kingdom are sure to remain in rather than those who do good works. Or as one recent commentary put it, this is R.T. France, one remains in not by doing good deeds, but by belonging to the priorities of the kingdom, whatever that's supposed to be. <laughs> I could go on. It's amazing. It, <laughs> this is almost perfectly wrong. <laughs> Green and others invert Matthew's insistence that it is those who actually show mercy, etc., who enter into life, rather than those who assume they belong because they have some connection to Jesus. In sum, for Matthew, the boundary between insider and outsider is, for Matthew, highly permeable, at least moving out. I don't see so much evidence going the other way. That's an interesting question. <laughs> Matthew is addressed to people, I think, who believed they had been rescued from sin and welcomed by God. But the insiders were not blessedly assured uh, of their position. If they failed to do what God required, they would be thrust into the outer darkness. All right, on to Paul. Paul's letters lack Matthew's lurid descriptions of weeping and teeth gnashing. He never clearly mentions anything like a hell. Maybe the closest he gets to it is 2 Thessalonians 1, and if he possibly didn't even write that. Like Matthew, however, Paul warns his churches that they are potential candidates for what he calls death, destruction, or corruption, even if it is difficult to understand quite what this entails. In a number of letters, he argues that rejection of the gospel message, or parts of it, such as the resurrection, would render converts' faith worthless. One of the clearest such warnings appears in his discussion of the unbelief or rejection of Jesus of fellow Israelites in Romans 11. In his well-known allegory of an olive tree, he says the portion of Israel that rejected the gospel was cut off, and Gentiles, uncultivated branches, were grafted in their place. He comments, and I'm going to read a few lines, If God did not spare the natural branches, perhaps he will not spare you. Note then the kindness and severity of God, severity toward those who have fallen, but God's kindness toward you, provided you continue in his kindness. <clears throat> Otherwise, you also will be cut off. Like Matthew, it's not exactly the same, Paul warns that the new in-group will suffer the same fate as their predecessors should they make the same error. Gentile Christians, then, occupy a position that is no less precarious than Israel's. Actually, it's more precarious because it's not natural, uh, according to nature, for them to belong. So God's kindness to them comes with strings attached. They must remain in that kindness or be eliminated. So he writes, do not be haughty, but stand in awe. Thus far, for Paul, I've only mentioned exclusion following rejection of the gospel message or one of its entailments. Did Paul share his Matthew conviction that sinful behavior or lack of good deeds could push an insider into the ranks of the damned? Some of the more influential studies of this issue in Paul, I think of Paul and Perseverance by Judith Gundry, argues that for Paul, rejection of the gospel message is the only thing that can exclude a Christian. No ethical failure could ever do so. Gundry and others recognize that Paul cautions uh, Christians against various sins that exclude one from the kingdom, so porneia and idolatry and things like that. But these passages are taken to be descriptions of what rank and file pagans will endure, not as a possible future for Paul's converts. It's true that none of these warning passages have Matthew's explicit threats or depictions of the damnation of professed Jesus followers. But if the failure of Jesus followers wasn't even a possibility, one wonders why Paul introduces these warnings while speaking of the convert's own deviant behavior. More fundamentally, however, I think one must ask whether Paul maintains a clear dichotomy between belief and behavior in the first place, such that the former is decisive where the latter is not. Is there any evidence of this split, or is this something that we have imposed upon him, perhaps encouraged by certain confessional concerns? An interesting place to test this view, this uh, belief-behavior split, is Paul's letter to the Galatians. Mm 
a letter which is propelled by his fear that the Galatians are about to embark on a course of action that would cut them off from Christ. In the penultimate portion of the letter, comprising most of chapters 5 and 6, Paul turns to moral teaching, describing behavior that leads to death, as well as that which leads to inheriting the kingdom, as he puts it. Though this portion of the letter is rather loosely organized, it is guided by a coherent focus on the opposition of spirit and flesh. The flesh is Paul's catch-all word for all that is opposed to the spirit, including everything from Gentile circumcision to idolatry. We find a good summary of this section in the final lines that he dictated before he picked up the pen and wrote the, the last greeting in his own hand. So this is six, uh, chapter 6, verses 7 through 10. Here, Paul pits flesh against spirit in a concise warning about how to attain eternal life. He begins by saying that God is not mocked, because whatever a person sows, this also he will reap. Paul then switches from the question of seed to soil. Quote, For the one who sows in his own flesh will reap destruction from the flesh, but the one who sows in the Spirit will reap eternal life from the Spirit. So let us not grow weary in doing the good, for we will reap in due time if we do not give up. So, um, apparently, to reap eternal life, it's necessary to remain steadfast and planting in the Spirit, which is here equated with doing the good. Those who plant in the Spirit by doing the good for all will reap eternal life in the future if they don't give up. So, in the conclusion of his exhortation, Paul sets out two fields. Those who plant in the flesh harvest ruin. Those who plant in the spirit harvest eternal life. Planting in the spirit is defined as working on behalf of others. Planting in the flesh would mean at least the absence of this action, and if read in light of the wider context, it would, flesh would include behavior which is socially destructive and debauched, rivalry, jealousy, factions, fornication, drunkenness, and small cars, and so on. <laughs> And of course, Paul ingeniously links circumcision to all of this under the, the, the heading flesh. Paul's reason for introducing ethics uh, here, moral behavior, is debated. You know, some have argued that he's fighting on two fronts. I don't think that's likely. Some have argued that he wants to convince the Galatians that the spirit is a, uh, an efficacious vehicle to the moral life, um, a better one than, than the law. We don't necessarily necessarily need to get into that now. For now, we need to note only that Paul is perfectly happy to warn the Galatians of a path of what happens if you sow to the Spirit, um, which ends in their in destruction. And this doesn't just include the rejection of his uh, Torah-free message, but also things like debauchery and dissension. Despite all this, so I'm, I'm arguing against with probably a, a consensus that, that Paul does suggest, though he's kind of gentle about it, that, that you know, sexual deviancy and things like that can, can move insiders outside, one does get the overall impression that in Matthew's world, it's much easier to get pushed out than in Paul. Paul manifests what one might call a strong inward current. All things being equal, those who are in Christ tend to stay there. And those without actually can get sucked in sometimes. This inward current is a persistent feature of his thought that manifests itself in a wide variety of settings. I'll, I'll give a few examples. These, these passages are all a little bit weird. They're all, they're all a little difficult and um, contested, and I don't claim to have cracked all of them, but set next to each other, they, they show an interesting tendency in his thought to, kind of, to try to pull people in, um, you wouldn't, in ways you wouldn't expect. First, Paul makes the grace or gift already received by Christians all but ensure a positive outcome in the end. As he puts it in Romans, the amazing thing has already happened because unworthy recipients received Christ. So it would be less of a surprise, Paul thinks, if these same recipients avoid the coming wrath of God. Unlike John's gospel, which brings judgment into the present, this positive outcome remains at the level of hope. It is not a fait accompli. But it does cause Paul to forecast that those who are in will remain in. Second, Paul occasionally claims that God's punishment of failing members of the church results somehow in their ultimate inclusion. After castigating the Corinthians for tolerating incest, he instructs them to hand the incestuous man over to Satan, that is, expel him from their assembly, 
So his flesh will be destroyed and his spirit will be saved in the day of the Lord. Though they are to force this man out, the purpose of this action is, apparently, his eventual eschatological reintegration. Similarly, early in this, earlier in the same letter, Paul describes the day when the work of he and other missionaries will be tested with fire. Poor apostolic work will be exposed and destroyed, and these poor workers will suffer loss. And yet Paul is confident they will still be saved, as it were, through fire. Thus, Paul is confident that both the incestuous man and inept missionaries will be condemned, but that this condemnation redounds somehow to their ultimate inclusion. Third, in the same letter, when Paul addresses the problem of mixed marriages, he claims that the unbelieving husband is sanctified by his wife and the <coughs> unbelieving wife by her husband. So one might expect him to say that one would be defiled by joining oneself to a pagan spouse, but in this case, instead, sanctity overwhelms uncleanliness and extends to the spouse and their children. Uh, he doesn't go so far as to say that the unbelieving spouse will certainly be saved in any final sense. This remains at the level of, of hope. But the expected movement is in the direction of the inclusion of the unbelieving spouse rather than the loss of the believer in, in this relationship. And a final example of of this tendency to pull people in in Paul's thought is in Romans 11 when Paul says that the disobedience of Israel will result in all Israel being saved. As with the incestuous man and the inept apostles, God turns disobedience here into the occasion of mercy, pulling those inside who don't appear to belong. In sum, like Matthew, Paul doesn't assume the empirical church is convertible with the actual one. Failings of various kinds can move one out. Yet, if Matthew's narrow way ex excludes most, Paul envisages just the opposite, a strong inward tug, keeping the faithful inside and possibly even pulling on outsiders. A few final things. We've seen that both Matthew and Paul warn of actions that would turn insiders into outsiders, and both set this possibility, possibility in parallel with the exclusion of those who had already rejected Jesus. So God did that to them, so also he would, he would do it to you. The most obvious difference is that Matthew insists that many within the church will be found wanting, whereas Paul never says any of his people will be excluded, and indeed he articulates a strong hope that none of them will be. I would suggest that this difference is not merely a matter of tone or optimism, but is rather indicative of a cluster of substantive differences in their thought. Though Matthew and Paul both affirm that the God they worship is the creator of the world, and both make it their explicit aim to bring the nations to obedience of that God, Paul is much more concerned to describe his gospel as divine mercy to the undeserving. This encourages his tendency, not consistently followed through, to say that mercy will overcome disobedience, leaving his later interpreters scratching their heads over who could ever possibly be excluded. And I think this is where the, the myth of, of Paul as universalist comes in, because once, mm -hmm. once one starts down this line of thought, it's, it's very difficult to stop. Mm -hmm. And so we have the Pauline tradition, say, in 1 Timothy, saying that God desires all people uh, to come to a knowledge of the truth and, and be saved. And we have the Pauline influence in um, Originism and uh, Latter-day Universalists. Mm -hmm. Moreover, for Paul, future bodily resurrection is a consequence of union with Christ in the present. Um, and this eschatological frame, which doesn't go so far as John to say that the judgment has already occurred, creates the strong presumption that the current visible church will be the same, or at least very similar to the one revealed as blameless in the parousia. Chris. This is a great paper. Thank you so much. So just reflecting on possible explanations for some of the reason, that, uh, the explanations for the differences between the two approaches, which you think you're right is one of tone and emphasis and this, this constant tug inward. Um, you know, Paul pretty explicitly, I think, is interested in um, the realization of the prophetic vision of the end days, which is one in which 
every tongue shall confess, every knee shall every knee shall bow. So it's the incoming of the Gentiles, um, and he's not at all interested in excluding anybody. He wants to kickstart the return of the Messiah by making it happen right now that everybody's gathered in, and he's willing to hold his nose and <laughs> let anybody in because that's the event he's trying to to get started. So if that vision is such a powerful motivating force for him rather than uh, Matthew, who may be more caught up in sort of the day-to-day -day divisions between communities and how they're getting along and so on, that might account for the, the difference to yeah, some extent. Yeah, thank, thank you. That, that's helpful. I, I, I think that's right. I, I suspect that for Matthew, in, instead of um, working toward the achievement of that vision, which with which he no doubt agreed, mm -hmm. he's more concerned to show that they're not, the Jesus followers aren't soft mm -hmm. on, on law. Mm -hmm. Which is why it's you know, set out programmatically in chapter five that that's mm. that their righteousness is even greater. That's interesting. So really, he's not trying to get anyone excluded. He's just trying to set a very clear bar and expectation and standard for it happening. Right? Is that what you're saying about Matthew to some extent? I, I think so, and I think it's also. I mean, I, I emphasize the the narrow way here in part because this the secondary literature is so off, right. but I mean. It is true that there's a tendency throughout Matthew to slide into the huge exaggeration. Sure. So, so everything is big. You know, the, the servant owed a bazillion dollars. And, and the way, of course, is, is minuscule. But this was a big time. Everybody <laughs> said big things. Right, right. It's, 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 <laughs> and, and so, and so and it's possible that if, if pressed or if confronted with the Pauline vision, you'd say, eh, you know, fine. But we still need to do justice to the description as it stands. Can I ask one quick question, which is sort of a bibliographic question, because if the answer is no, then I think I might have a paper to write. But um, the, the parable about the banquet and the king burning down the house and then sort of the new guests afterwards, has anybody compared that with the Talmudic story of the feast and the banquet and the destruction of the temple and the rabbis saving a remnant and forming a new community? Has anyone done a one-to-one -one with that motif, a one-to-one -one comparison to your Klein's own? Klein Snodgrass would be the place to check um, if, if he doesn't mention, so I don't know of anything specific. If he doesn't mention it, then it probably doesn't exist. Well, I got something to do this summer. <laughs> I would, I would imagine Dale Allison has probably flagged it, but I don't know if yeah. he's discussed okay. it right. closely. Okay, all right, good to know. Knowing Dale. No. Tobias and then Okay. So thank you very much for a very rich paper. Um, one or two points. Um, the first point is, is it, isn't it also possible that for Paul, this question of being outside is partly so much lacking because it's so difficult to say who we are. So, uh, <laughs> in a certain sense, what would uh, a, 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 a Pauline follower of Christ, if you ask him, what, what kind of group are you? Are you? What does it mean? What would be his or her answer? Uh, I, and that's why I think he, he always has to create images mm. to say, okay, we, this is uh, this is our group, uh, and that's why the question of being outside is perhaps something that's more difficult. Uh, or the sec only the, the only second question, uh, and the second point, a very small thing, is this question of uh, relation between uh, belief and behavior. As at, at least from my perspective. Uh, there's in uh, First Corinthians where this is uh, in a certain sense a problem. Problem, I think uh, he binds it together in First Corinthians and at least indirectly in Philippians and perhaps uh, two Corinthians with the idea of the news Christu. Mm -hmm. so at one line, I think we should have the same news, and then to sixteen, we have the news Christu, and I think it's coming later again, and then this news, which he in a certain sense describes, is always something like a criterion of, 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 of what does it mean to believe and what uh, does it mean to be behave. And I think one can play through it uh, at least in, in, several, in several of these, of these letters. And this is just a remark, and I'm not sure whether this is uh, <laughs> right, but at least from, from my perspective, this is something which is perhaps helpful. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. That, that is helpful. I think it, 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 that, that sounds right. I mean, it leads to the, the, the old problem as it's often described um, between the indicative and the imperative in Paul, where he thinks there's, there's possession of, of something that they, that they are, in a sense, you know, wh where they ought to be, and they just need to sort of follow it through. 
Um, what I'm interested in is the, the fact that it, it appears that he, he does take seriously the possibility, perhaps unlike John, that, that th though there's the expectation that those who have the mind of Christ, those who are in Christ, will behave accordingly, of course they don't always. And, and why would he be, why would he tell them all, you know, set out two ways before them, the way of destruction and the way of eternal life, if he thought that sim simply, simply having this, you know, this, this current state was a, it assured them of a positive outcome. Um, but you have to thank, thank you. Yeah. Uh, very, very, very small additional point. Uh, if you, for example, uh, regarding this question, if you ask these people, what are you? And if you go so far to say that the word, even the word ecclesia doesn't mean community, but just gathering, right? Mm -hmm. That right. is even more difficult. To say yes. That. That's just a little additional point. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, that's a, that's a good point. Yeah. Okay. Um, when I introduced myself uh, yesterday, I said that uh, I had a strong interest in the social sciences. <laughs> and I want to respond to uh, your paper uh, very much from that perspective. Uh, and to a certain extent to uh, try to see what happens if I turn some of the things that you've um, discussed inside out from the perspective of a social scientist. And for that reason, I'm not sure that I would talk so much about permeability in Matthew as I would talk about what seems to me, as you've described it, as the overwhelming need to identify outsiders and exclude outsiders as a way of strengthening the identity of the insiders. And that the, uh, this seems to me the way I would put the pieces together, not as an open, not as a community, as a community that's struggling, that to identify who really belongs in, in order to try to figure out just who we are. And I would put your point that way, it's slightly different than the way you put it. That's point number one. Point number two, um, because to some extent I'm a social scientist, uh, I have a strong disposition against giving primary place to thought and ideas. I would give a much more primary place to social structures. And I think it is social structures that help generate ideas and the ideas come along afterwards to clean up after the social structures that determine the reality, whatever it is. And therefore, I would be much more interested in asking about Paul or about Matthew, what is the social structure of their community? And I think the remarks that we've just heard uh, go in that direction. And how does the difference in social structure, to the extent that we can determine it, and it's not so easy to determine, in this case, helped explain the ideas and helped form the uh, link between, uh, actually, probably better, the feedback loop between the structures, the ideas, in which the structure helps generate the ideas, <coughs> and the ideas help reinforce uh, the structure. Yeah, thanks. I think um, the basic methodological uh, response the ideas, or what the text actually says, is the only access that we have to our how we might construct um, those those relationships. Yeah. And so, what I'm interested in doing here, and and much of the time actually, is making sure I get the ideas straight because that's our, our first point of entry to all these other more remote objects of consideration. Right. And that and that yes, once once we understand, for instance, that contrary to what most, especially theologically motivated Matthean scholarship, is saying, Matthew does have this. Like highly permanent, you know, this outward flowing current rejection of, of Jesus followers. Once we get that straight, then we can mm. begin to think okay. about what was going on in his setting, right. why why that made made sense to him. Okay. Uh, I have a question. Actually, I have two two thoughts, and I think they're connected. Or I'm going to try to connect them, no matter how tenuously. Um, you, you talked about this. You talked very sort of obliquely about Paul in this um, force pushing people in. Uh, and I immediately think Numa, of course, for Paul. I'm guessing this is what you're maybe hinting toward. Is this one of the key differences theologically between Paul and Matthew? Matthew has not a great emphasis on this holy Numa. And for Paul, this divine, this newly available divine power 
Uh, of course it's going to trump human sinfulness. Uh, and of course it's going to draw people in because this is a deeply contagious form of holiness that overwhelms impurity. Um, Chris, you, you in a paper a few years back talked about robo-righteousness yep. in Paul. And I wonder if, if this is helpful. Paul just has this belief that God is going to overwhelm human volition or completely He's going to change, modify change it. human character. He's going to yeah, modify it so they're, they're obeying naturally. Yeah. And that, uh, I mean, that's and, connected. When I said fulfilling the prophetic visions, right? I was thinking exactly. of Jeremiah and Ezekiel. Yeah, and those right. are the two mm-hmm. spots where they say God will change the heart. You know, right. the new covenant is not actually a new covenant. It's a new heart, that, right. that will, uh, which leads to robo-righteousness. You'll just no longer feel the temptations of sin. And I think that that's what Paul is saying. For, for Christians, faith is enough. That's all you need. For Jews, faith is needed so that you can now have the robo righteousness you need to automatically fill the law, fulfill the law. So you still have to fulfill the law. But I think it's connected. I think that. So is this is this one key difference between Paul and Matthew? Yes, I'm, I'm so glad, and I, I promise that I, I didn't uh, put, put him up to this. No, I, I one way of framing later. The, one way of framing the paper it could have just been to, to look at the difference in you could call it eschatology. I mean, they they both have an idea of a coming end, and that somehow it's broken in. But it's this it's the spirit that is the big difference for Paul. Yeah. That, um, and so, you know, Matthew throws out references in chapter 10 to the Holy Spirit giving you the words that you need when you're called before uh, authorities, but he doesn't really do anything with it. There's no, whereas, whereas for Paul, this one of the, you know, Christ, um, Christ in the person, the people in Christ, uh, co-crucifixion, participation in the death and rest of Christ through the Spirit, all that, that's what makes it, that's what makes it yeah. work. That's why he has the confidence um, that these people can yeah. I, don't, I don't think that's the only structural yeah. difference, but that's an important one. And interestingly, I think reception history of both Matthew and Paul show that this is the big thing that's actually missing from Paul if we, if we judge, or missing from Matthew, from Matthew. If, we, if we judge it according to, to, Paul. to Paul. Because when you get to people like Augustine, what do you do when you get to the, the Sermon on the Mount? And he gets up and says, I know, I know you thought you were supposed to do this, but now you have to do all these other things too. Um, what, he, what he never says, and what ancient readers of, of Matthew desperately wanted him to say is that this is because the, the Spirit has written the law in your hearts and now you're able to do this. And so they, they pull Paul and the fruit of the Spirit into the, the Sermon on the Mount, and then that became, the, as far as I know, the standard reading. Uh, yeah, I think that's exactly right. But a, another big structural difference, I think, is Matthew's emphasis on, um, as John Barclay's recently called it, the incongruity of, mm-hmm. of grace. There's a big emphasis on giving it to people who don't deserve it. Um, which isn't to say it's not gracious in Matthew, but, but once, once there's an emphasis on the gift coming to the undeserving, it's hard to know. I mean, if, if, if one follows that train of thought, it's, it's very difficult not to end up with some kind of Calvinist predestination, yeah. double predestination yeah. Oh, yeah. on the one hand, yeah. or universalism on, on the yeah. other. Both of those did follow. I'll try to be very quick. My, my follow-up, uh, connected point. Is there also a temporal gap that leads to these differing conceptions? Paul's writing pretty soon after the event. He has this idea of robo righteousness. He has this idea that Israel's going to come in. They're going to believe imminently. Um, and then they don't. And every year that goes by, hmm. his robo righteousness idea becomes more and more problematic. Mm-hmm. Uh, so by Matthew, it's already maybe a bit of a problem. First two thousand years, it's like extremely problematic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, no, I, I, I think that's right, and, that, and this actually is in accord with your yeah. reading of John and, 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 and your comment also uh, that we see, I think, moving from Paul to Matthew, a step in the direction perhaps of something like what we find in a reader of Matthew, Ignatius of Antioch, where it's just not, it's just not working. Yeah. And so, if 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 the rest of Israel isn't coming in, we need to define ourselves over against them. Our righteousness is better. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I think a lot of the, the emphasis on, on, on works is just that. It's not just to warn insiders, which it clearly also is. It's also to say, and, and we're outdoing you, know, you, you guys over there. And possibly also to, to speak to people in sort of the, the Nicodemus range, you know, people on the, on the margins. Well, maybe one final question. Thanks a lot for the paper. Um, do you take the chronological order of the two writings and the opposition we've heard here uh, about the two texts a step further. We have a lot of tough discussion recently about uh, Matthew being an anti-Baline text. Mm. 
Um, I'm not too sure about uh, these theories. Um, what do you think about it? Would it be a, an element in such a reading? Um, do you see some aspects proving this true or false? That's, that's the question I was uh, afraid to be asked. Because um, <laughs> I, 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 I don't know. Um, I mean, if you look at the debate between people like Sim mm. and or John Meyer. Uh, why doesn't Matthew talk about circumcision? Um, I, I, I think if we just take the text as it stands, we have to assume that they were... He doesn't. He doesn't tell us anything that would that would think that the you know when it ends with the great commission go out to all, to all the nations. If if all we know is what the text says, I would think that that would include circumcision mm -hmm. for for them. But I, I'm I'm really I'm not sure. I go back and forth. Mm -hmm. I, I I'm open to okay. elimination. Yeah. Daniel. Is it, yeah. Thank you. I wonder. Uh, maybe this is sort of a, in between the ideas and the social structures question. But whether. Uh, it seemed in your presentation, say if you take with uh, Matthew, you presented it as sort of a, especially with the, the banquet parable about people being put outside or brought inside, sort of a, uh, in, and then the parable is individuals. Right. Uh, but whether that could, uh, the way that functions, uh, you know, say literarily for the community, whether it would be less about uh, uh, emphasizing putting individuals out or bringing individuals in, and maybe more of uh, defining a, a criterion of what would count as legitimate membership. So in the sense of uh, setting the stage of there are certain realm of ethical behaviors that uh, uh, are the criterion for being a proper member of the community. And so less about if it's less about saying if this individual doesn't do it, we're gonna kick him out or you know this or that, but more just saying uh, what would uh, make for a member in good standing. You know, and then if someone doesn't do that, they ought to think for themselves to get back on track, or other people ought to encourage them. But just as a, defining the social, the, the standards of the social structure through those those parables. <coughs> there, there are many. I mean, that's that's basically the majority report from Athenian scholarship. Right. Is that it would be something like that. The the hesitation that I have is that he seems to go out of his way in excruciating detail again and again and again to describe individuals who didn't measure up, who seemed to belong, but who didn't. And it's kind of the anonymity, say the, the sheep and the goats in Matthew 25, where it, it just comes down to a, a, a sifting of the people who did the things and who didn't. It could be that in Matthew's setting, one of the main things he wants to accomplish through this is not, you know, and presumably um, Jonathan <coughs> Edwards preached sinners in the hands of, the, of an angry God. It's because he, not because he wanted the congregation to, to end up in the hands of an angry God, but to, you know, to end up inside. So something analogous could, could, be, could be working, but that um, my argument would be that we need to, to take much more seriously, at least on the face of it, his repeated descriptions of, of, of individuals. I mean, it's, it's telling in that particular parable, you have a whole group of people that's rejected, and then of the new people that are invited in, it's, it's just one, one person. Right. I mean, it could still function to if you want to. You ultimately use it to exclude people. It could. Individuals. So it's it just it, it can function on. It could. Yeah, yeah, I think so. Yeah. Yeah. Really, really short. Sure. No. Okay. <laughs> Is it possible that what we really have are just two first and second century manifestations of what are already dueling visions of the end, such as we see articulated well, in various prophetic texts, which really cast. The Gentiles out and only Israel is saved, and the Qumran community, which has its sons of darkness and its sons of lights, and I don't think in the end time the sons of darkness are incorporated into the sons of light, versus the Jeremiah or the Ezekiel or the Zechariah or the other places where everybody is finally joined together, still differentiated. Gentiles only go, come so far, they just recognize God, right? But, you know, so that maybe they're just really two manifestations of these two earlier Israelite streams. I, I think that that's probably right, and that alongside it is also a disagreement in the or an ambiguity in the emerging belief of eternal life or resurrection, right. which some texts everyone is raised so that God can judge the nations, and in others resurrection is itself the reward of the righteous. Right, right, right. And, and Paul falls hardly in the, you know strongly in the in the latter camp, right. and so it creates two completely two different. Completely ideas. Whereas the other yes. model lends itself to eschatological surprise. Mm -hmm. you know, everyone's mm -hmm. going to pop up again so that God mm -hmm. can pick out the good ones. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Tobias. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, a very good start to the morning and the day.
Let's take uh, a break. We're going to reconvene at 11.15, so half an hour. Very generous break. Stretch your legs. Do whatever you need to do.